Hello, let's talk about Soviet urban planning, explore its advantages, what's wrong with it, and compare it to traditional block planning. We'll do this using the city of Polotsk in Belarus, where I live as an example. Here we have both the historical city planning and the Soviet layout from different periods. First, a little background. Polotsk is quite a small city, about 80,000 people live here. The city is old, the year of foundation is considered to be 862. However, there are not many historical buildings left because of the frequent wars that took place here. The last time the city was destroyed was during World War II. So most of its development falls on the second half of the 20th century. And before that it suffered a little during World War I. And before that it was completely destroyed during the Napoleonic Wars. It was at that time that the layout of the historical center of the city was formed. It is a traditional grid with a block size equal to what you might find in New York, for example. The Commissioner's Plan of 1811 was at the time the most current idea in urban planning. In Polotsk, Soviet air development is represented by individual micro-districts, which alternate with those of historical and modern planning. Let's look at a typical micro-district which can be found in any city in the post-Soviet territory. To begin with, post-war Soviet architecture is a branch of modernist architecture. Modernist ideas in urban planning can be found all over the world, but in the Soviet Union they had their own features. The main feature of the modernist approach to urban planning is what makes it so different from the classical attitude is the location of building relative to the road. In classical planning, buildings are located along the street, creating a continuous corridor of walls. In the modernist approach, buildings are inside a large plot of land. Buildings themselves are gathered into a composition and are similar in essence to sculpture, which can be seen from afar and from all sides. A large road goes around it, thus forming a huge block. In my city, its sides are about 1 km by 400 meters. These roads going around are connecting parts of the city, and inside there are narrow passageways for access to each house. This is what forms a micro-district, and this is what differentiates it from a city block. The main idea of micro-district is that it was supposed to be a new model for building cities throughout the Soviet Union. First of all, it is extremely flexible. Thanks to the large amount of space inside, it can be configured as required. Inside a micro-district, you can have residential buildings, schools, stores, hospital, factories, fire stations, stadium, swimming pool. In general, anything you want with no size limit. In a block layout, each of these large structures would disturb the street grid. Thus, you can create a set of necessary infrastructure, which will be within walking distance. Then, get generic designs for houses, schools, hospital, and build it. In addition, compared to a block, there are much less roads and utilities that need to be maintained. Very convenient, and more importantly, fast and cheap. The best thing about all of this is that fast and cheap is not achieved by terrible savings on materials or basic conveniences, but by use of technology and scalability. Not only houses, but much of this social infrastructure was built really quickly and in the right quantities. All thanks to large panel construction technology, where house parts are made in a factory and then just get assembled at the construction site. As for the price, in Soviet times housing was given on a waiting list. In small cities like Polotsk, the queue for housing was shorter, and in large cities it was longer. But now such apartments remain the most budget-friendly option for housing. In poor countries, especially in small towns, housing prices do not increase over time, but rather depend on the cost of construction. And for the price of an apartment, a house with the same level of comfort would be simply impossible to build. We're talking about prices around $20,000 for an apartment in a house built in the 70s. You can easily find one for even less money. For 25 30 grand, you can buy a fairly nice apartment of decent size. 
Unfortunately, with salaries of 2 to 400 bucks a month and loans of 20% annually, housing is still quite expensive. On the other hand, hey, it's still real estate for the price of Toyota Corolla. So, what do you get for $20,000 in a small Belarusian city? The apartments are actually not bad. They handle basic needs well. It's warm enough in winter, there's a bathtub, there are no power outages, there's fast fiber optic internet almost everywhere. All that's left to do is to make a renovation. It's still worth admitting these houses are pretty well maintained. From the main problems, I would mention terrible noise isolation. But here you have to look at a particular house. Somewhere it is better, somewhere worse. Sometimes you can hear without any problems what the neighbors on the floor below are talking about. The layout of all Soviet houses is about the same. The house is divided into entrances. Each of them has a staircase and normally one elevator. The entrances are not connected to each other in any way. If you want to get from one part of the building to the other, you have to go outside. This allows you to build houses of any length by simply repeating the module. Usually, there are four apartments on each floor around one staircase. It is quite private. In houses above five floors, there is an elevator. The apartments have fairly standard layouts. They are okay, but you can't really replan them. The internal partitions are the load-bearing structure of the house. There is usually one window in the rooms. And the rooms themselves are quite stretched. The ends of the buildings are usually just a blank wall. About bathrooms. Generally, there is only one bathroom in an apartment. No more. Even if you have three bedrooms, you will most likely have one bathroom. Well, let's say you fell for my ad and moved here. Or you already live here. Let's see what the neighborhood is like from a local's point of view. There are a lot of greenery around, at least in summer. It's very comfortable and pleasant, especially when it's well kept. All that infrastructure which was built during the Soviet Union hasn't got anywhere. You don't need to drive your child to school. You can walk there in just a few minutes. Just look at how many of them are around. If you fall ill and need a doctor consultation, you can always go to the nearest clinic. Do you want to work out? The sports field is at your service. Do you want Japanese food? And then my whole story begin to change its tone from positive to negative. Because now we are confronted with non-obvious problems typical for the Soviet approach to urban planning. And they pull one another, making the whole city layout much more problematic than it should be. Let me explain. The Soviet Union was a centrally planned economy, where the government determined that a person need this, that and that. Private businesses did not exist at the time, and thus neither did any general purpose of commercial space as we are used to. Therefore, if the party said that you need a school, a stadium and a place to walk, then you will have it near your home. Very convenient and within walking distance. And you don't need a Japanese restaurant, by the way. And if in Soviet times this was not a problem, because there were only those things that were needed according to the state, now it has become a problem. Businesses cannot be placed near residential buildings, because there is simply no space near them where it can be opened. Everything that can be reached on foot is already occupied by social infrastructure, which means you have to drive. In fact, if you don't use infrastructure that was originally put in place and you have other needs, there is nothing near your home at all. All of this leads to the creation of shopping malls that have no connection to a city. They have very poor pedestrian accessibility. The reason is that they are built in places with plenty of space, which often means the outskirts of the city. That's where people from all the micro-districts go for their basic day-to-day -day needs. In traditional development, the space on the ground floors is allocated for commercial use. And because of the block development, the entrance to these spaces comes right off the sidewalk. Unfortunately, in my city, the amount of historical block development is pretty small. What's remarkable, though, is that you see a lot more people on the streets here 
That's simply because they like to spend more time here and there's more things to do. Oh, the long and constant driving for every little thing is just the beginning of the problems. Due to the fact that you have to drive a lot and public transport in poor countries is not the best, buses cost about the same regardless of the level of GDP per capita, raided the question of buying a car. In Soviet times, the question of controlling the number of cars in a city was solved simply. Owning a car was not so much a luxury as a life goal. It was necessary to make a huge amount of effort to get one. Years of waiting in queues discouraged most people from owning a car. And there was no particular need for it. I have already said that back then most people's needs were limited to their neighborhood. So there were a dozen parking places for a nine-story building. What do we have now? Even in our poor country, most people can afford to save a couple thousand dollars and buy themselves a 20-year-old car, which will drive them around. And where to park the car? In the world practice of modernist architecture, the question is solved by underground parking. It's a good solution. But who will build them in cheap housing, even more so if only a dozen parking spaces are located per house? And now this green space between the houses, where ideally there should be no cars at all, turns into a dirty mess by dumping cars straight onto the lawn. In autumn it looks ten times worse. But parking is only one problem. What's worse is the fact that all these people who live in this neighborhood have to go somewhere for any occasion. It's a huge strain on the transportation network. In traditional block playing, the streets are narrow, but there's a lot of them. And the traffic is evenly distributed throughout the city. Here, however, there are not enough streets to accommodate all the cars. The roadway begins to widen. And for them to pass faster, the traffic begins to speed up. All of this, of course, leads to traffic jams. They arise from the poor layout of the city, which forces everyone to drive somewhere all the time. And if for any reason the street is blocked, it becomes a disaster for the entire city because of the lower density of roads, the bypass becomes much more difficult. And the only reason why there are not a lot of traffic jams in Polotsk in particular is because the city is small in size and number of inhabitants. There is a reason that there are five post-Soviet cities in the top 10 of the TomTom -tom traffic jam ranking. And here arises perhaps the biggest problem that affects the quality of the urban environment. The city's main streets, which connect the micro-districts, are not designed for anything other than moving along them. Buildings don't line up along the road, they in the depth. There is nothing to see here, nothing to visit along the way, no place to sit on a bench or walk at a table in a cafe. All you can do here is move from point A to point B, along a lonely space around 130 meters wide between an empty lawn and a wide road. There is no advantage of being a pedestrian here. By car you can get exactly the same experience, expect you get to your destination faster and with more comfort. Humans like to be on the quiet, narrow streets. There is a lot to see and interact with. A yard is a special topic in micro districts. It all starts with the question of what even counts as a yard in this space with the randomly spaced houses. In fact, everything around is a yard. In the best tradition of socialism, it belongs to everyone and no one at the same time. Its maintenance is done by the city authorities. Huge empty fields of grass of the micro-districts need to be moved. Because there are so many obstacles around and no one has leveled the landscape, it is impossible to move it with a tractor in most cases. Everything must be done manually. While one place is being moved, the grass is already grown in the other place. This continuous buzzing of movers lasts all through the summer. And that's all because there is a lot of space around which is not used in any useful way. In some microdistics, it reached to the point of absurdity, as if each resident of high-rise building was allocated a plot of lawn, and then they put them all together in front of the house. 
overall we see the same problems that plug suburbs. The only problem is that it is not a suburb, it is the city itself. You don't see this kind of historic downtown with block development in every city. It doesn't even have the advantage that the suburbs have. The area of apartment in such building is 30 to 70 square meters. There is no parking. The neighbors may be inadequate and you will hear every word they say. The disadvantages of micro districts are not so obvious and apply mostly to the Soviet features of modernism. Given the huge empty space around each house, the population density here is not very high, and density in itself is not a guarantee of a good space to live in, if the benefits of density are not used in any way. Let's see how these ideas can be improved and refined so that the city would be convenient for residents. I will use Hong Kong as an example. I was there in 2019 and was able to study everything carefully and experience how well it is designed. In general, modernist architecture and its approach to urban planning is popular in Asia. To begin with, the development of Hong Kong in the 50s and 60s was very similar to what you see in the Soviet Union. Just as in the USSR, they were built in a hurry to give the people a home after the devastating war. But over time, ideas evolved and eliminated the shortcomings I mentioned earlier. Plots are much smaller with no empty spaces because land costs money. A lot of money. For the same reason of efficiency and economy, the streets are much narrower. This makes them far less noisy, much safer and more pleasant to walk on. All the ground floors of the buildings are used for commercial needs and the market decides what type of business fits here best. By the 80s and 90s, the image of Hong Kong housing took its shape. These are oddly shaped towers which stand freely in groups within the same block. Often they have a common base which is also a shopping center, facades of which facing the sides of the block. Ground floor of it can even be connected to a subway station or a bus terminal. Sometimes several of these clusters are connected by bridges over the upper levels of the mall and frequently they have a functional roof which is used as a public space. The result is a highly sophisticated and extremely effective three-dimensional layout. Add to this very high economic conditions of the residents which allows the city to maintain great public transportation. Overall, Hong Kong is a much more comfortable, efficient and pedestrian-friendly city than what can be seen in the vast territories of the former Soviet Union. Let's be honest, Soviet urban planning is far from the best and clearly does not meet modern requirements. Even in Moscow at the end of the 80s, these ideas never developed into anything greater. Just houses became much taller. However, this does not mean that everything should be torn down or treated badly. This housing still serves a good function and provides a roof for millions of people. There is still great access to social infrastructure and plenty of green space. All over Eastern Europe there are many great examples of buildings and neighborhoods from this era being renovated and adapted to modern needs wherever possible. There is nothing wrong with modernist architecture as long as it used properly. In many Asian cities these ideas are alive and doing well. I hope you found this brief too useful and that you learned something. If you enjoyed this too, please hit like and subscribe. And you can always ask me anything in the comments about this topic. I'll be happy to answer you. Well, if you really, really like it, you can always come here and buy an apartment for the price of Toyota Corolla.